find something in the 15th, 16th century, possibly. Okay, good morning, everybody here in the conference room and all others who attend the webcast. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Les Newman, or Neumann, sorry, uh, for inviting me to speak about business enhancement through intelligent sales process management. And I'd like especially to thank Jim Groninger for his kind introduction. Thank you very much, Les and Jim. It was great, thank you. Let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Gert, I pronounce it Newman. Um, I'm president of Business Enhancement Solutions, LLC. For the last 10 years, I worked as B2B sales mentor and business consultant, helping small, medium-sized, and Fortune 500 companies uh, increase their bottom line by improving their sales and business processes. As an example, I helped Siemens win a $100 million contract in a situation with strong competition from competing vendors all around the world. And I transformed an architectural firm in North Carolina from trouble in getting sales to almost doubling their staff in less than six months to fulfill all the orders they were winning. Um, let me also mention that I successfully worked as CEO of Nokia Cable, where I managed a major turnaround, and as VP of Sales at Ericsson with full P&L responsibility. Um, the measurements come from the fact that I have a PhD in physics, so I like to measure the unmeasurable. <laughs> um, my background includes experiences in many industries, such as the solar, green, um, a renewable energy area, technology, telecommunications, computer software, and further industries that are in the B2B business. Now, let's begin with the sales process. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the pre-sales path on the right-hand side of the sales process. The four top boxes here define things that marketing does and they are required to start with lead generation, finally end at the sales process. That's market definition, market segments, and so on, target customer definition, and so on. The leads generation part, uh, lead generation can be done by database research, trade shows, and at any event where company employees can get business cards from potential leads. All the lead, leads go into the barrel of leads, which is nothing else than a major database. There are three major processes that run on, these, uh, on, on this database inside the barrel of leads. First one is lead verification, qualification. That's the first time that research is done on these leads in order to figure out if these leads are really interesting for the company. That's a very important filter tool. Whoops, push the wrong button. Oops. Okay. Um, the second important pro uh, process, that is follow up, keep in touch. This is run by the companies, uh, sending out newsletters, um, information about the company, the products, new product launches, and a lot of other things. This is an ongoing, continuing process. In most companies, the, the, the part that I described right now, this part, that is typically done by marketing, uh, but the handover to sales is somewhere inside the barrel of leads. It's different from company to company. The only thing that's really important here is that this handover point from marketing to sales need to be clearly defined. Otherwise you lose leads or uh, you get in trouble with not uh, forwarding the information. In most companies, the, set, the third process, which is scheduling uh, meetings with leads or with indiv uh, individual lead in order to generate or pr give a presentation to that lead, that is typically the first point where the sales department gets involved. <laughs> now, this presentation can end with two outcomes. If the, the lead is not interested, the lead goes back into the barrel of leads because it doesn't mean that the uh, lead is, will be never interested. Right now, 
the lead is not interested, but in the future, they may be interested. In case the lead is interested, then it's turned into, uh, moved into the barrel of prospects. <coughs> and that's where the sales process begins. This day when this happens, that is the starting day of the core sales process. Within the barrel of prospects, there are two major uh, processes in itself. One is a professional selling process that consists of, for example, business analysis. So people have to understand the business, the requirements of these prospects, and also the market environment they are working in, especially also their objective. This is used to define values. Uh, we will come back to this in more detail later and to present the values, but also to combat competition. The, sec the second major process here is relationship management, which means increase the relationships, especially to decision makers within time until the time of the decision. Okay, the objective of working with these two uh, major processes is to win customer agreements or to win an order. Uh, after that, that has been um, done successfully. Um, the uh, company has to fulfill the order by doing project management, operation management, and whatever else is required. But one thing is important, the customer now goes back, from a sales point of view, back into the barrel of prospects because repeat business is even easier now. Now, oops. How is the sales process measured? In most companies, the only measurement is the final output of the sales process. Uh, and it's measured in number of orders won and the size of these orders, which together are a good measure for the expected revenue. But there is an additional uh, measurement which is important but less frequently measured. It's the success rate. It measures the efficiency and the productivity of sales. Success rate is defined as number of orders won divided by number of orders attempted to win. It's nothing else than the output here, number of orders that get out here, and number of leads that get into the barrel of prospects. That's, that is a hit, a hit or success rate, and it measures productivity. So altogether, the three important measures are number of projects won, size of the orders, and success rate. Uh, these measures define the overall performance of your company's sales process. What are the benefits of knowing these numbers? They allow calculating backwards. When you know the three numbers, you know at any time, at, at, at any day in the year, how many prospects need to be in the barrel of prospects to fulfill your sales objectives. When you have calculated this, you can calculate backward how many leads must be in the barrel of leads to feed that cycle. So that's the importance of these three measures. But this general and statistical view on the sales process is necessary, but it's not sufficient. What is required is the focus on each individual sales process for each individual sales project. The point is every customer or every prospect is different in a different situation, business situation, and also the comp competition is different. But in most companies, these um, individual sales processes are not measured. Why is that? <coughs> These companies do not have trustworthy and reliable tools to do so. So what are the issues if this does not get measured? The sales first one, first, sales profession do not get an early alert when a sales project uh, runs out of control. As a result, they cannot recognize when they need to take action and what needs to be done to stay on the road to win. Secondly, without a measurable and systematic approach, sales professionals will spend time on all projects, whether or not they can be won. Imagine 
how they would perform if they had a tool that would enable them to focus their time on projects with a measurably higher chance of being won and, in addition, in a timely way. And thirdly, sales professionals provide the senior VP of sales or the sales executive with forecasts which are based on their optimism. And sales professionals are optimistic. They have to be optimistic because they have to bring the op optimism out to the potential customer. The back side of the coin is they are also optimistic to their own VP of senior VP of sales. As a result, the senior VP of sales is not able to provide a trustworthy forecast to the CEO. And when the CEO bases decisions on that, it's risky. All these issues that you see here on the chart are overcome by introducing intelligent sales process management. Um, nothing <laughs> happened. <laughs> so me which measures do sales professionals and sales executives need to overcome this issue? So let me compare the situation with a pilot in a small plane. There are two instruments the pilot needs the most in order to fly uh, the plane. Two that are really important. One is altitude, the other one is speed. So when the altitude is not high enough, the plane will crash. If the speed is too low, the plane will crash also. In sales, these two meters, or these two instruments, measure the profession, professional selling factor and the relationship factor. The professional selling factor utilizes measurable sub-goals to be achieved at the prospect, and the relationship factor utilizes measurable achievements in the relationship with prospects decision-makers. Both factors are clearly defined from 0 to 100 percent in steps of 10 percent. Uh, so sales professionals cannot guess on their own what they always try to do. And both factors do not depend just on actions performed by sales professionals. Instead, they measure the prospect's response due to these actions. And these measurements provide a much better view on how the prospect feels and if the prospect supports your company. Again, most of today's measurements base, uh, base the measurement on the sales professional's guesses or just on the actions they do, but not on the response. Now, how does intelligent sales process management look like? This is a chart drawn from an Excel sheet. Uh, I just want to make sure that the key point is the date, because when the time passes in a sales project, your objectives become more important, more tougher, so the time is updated every day when the sales, uh, the date is uh, updated every day when the salesperson turns on the computer. Oh. Um, you have, we see two major boxes, that's one here, which uh, lists the new customers that the salesperson, the sales professional is working on. Um, these are four entries here with the names of these companies. And we have another box here. These are the existing customers. We have two entries here for the existing customers. This column here um, shows the expected revenue here and here. And these are the professional selling factors in percent and the relationship factors that have been achieved by the sales professional uh, up to uh, April 18, 2011. Now, also, the, um, these data are important. It's the date where the sales process began. That means where the lead word went from the barrel of leads into the barrel of prospects. And the expected date when the customer will make a decision. It's here and here. Now, the rest is calculated by the computer. So the computer calculates the deviation and probability. That's this line. Even minus two is still OK even minus eight is still okay. This column shows the average deviation of both factors together. If one of these goes beyond minus 10, it's a major alert. In this column, we see alerts 
that are based on the point that the PS factor is not, uh, not sufficient. <coughs> and in this column, you don't see anything right now here. Here you see the RS factor for this project is not sufficient. For example, what does it mean when the PS factor is not sufficient? It means that the 30% should be at least 40% at on, the, on April 18th in order to stay on the right track and right road to win. This way that you see here allows the sales professional to um, prioritize uh, these projects in a much smarter way than other systems do because they tell every day what they should do. So they have one, two, three, four projects that they should work on here in the, in the near future. And they know exactly here and here is the relationship factor here and here they should increase both and here and here. They look at the definitions, see the next objectives and know what to do. Yes, please. Obviously each one of these have different factors. I would assume that in a deeper report, you're gonna be able to tell them what to do in sales, what needs to be done. Um, I, I, the time is not enough to define clearly right now the definitions that are behind these factors. But these factors set objectives in the professional selling and in the relationship side, it's even a step higher objective to be achieved. Now what can happen in a, in a way that uh, he wants to or he or she wants to achieve 40%, tries, tries it, tries it with the customer achieve the objective, but it doesn't work. That's because it's dependent on the positive feedback from the customer. It doesn't work. In that case, the sales professional will go to the senior vice president and say, well, I have an issue here. And the senior vice president can make two two choices, there's two choices. One choice would be say, okay, I try to help you. I will, next time I will visit the, the prospect together with you and I try to help you to get, to get up this objective. That's one way of doing it. The other way could be saying, okay, it looks like this is an early warning, an early uh, information from the prospect that they will not award us with a contract. It could be. So in that case, it makes sense to drop the project and say, don't waste your time with that project anymore. Stop it right away and focus on other more <coughs> promising prospects. Both decisions increase the efficiency of the sales organization, of the sales team. But there is so far no other tool that allows to do this decision in the middle of the sales process. You know? Sales professionals always wait until the end work until the end of the sales cycle and then are surprised if they win or lost. There is no surprise anymore here using that one here. Okay? Um, uh, we can discuss the definitions later on in detail. It's a, it's a long list behind it. Good. So it's, I said it generates a much smarter way of um, prioritizing the, the projects. Other priority settings just base it on, uh, on saying, well, let's go for the $250,000 project because the highest one, but they neglect other, other projects then, which then automatically run out of control. So this is a smart way of doing this. Um, I, want, oops. I want to show you what happens if this, oh, by the way, I forgot something. Um, here you see another alert. This alert says increase the number of projects. It says with that number, which is, uh, which is uh, still required, you will not achieve the yearly objective to even take it down to April 18th. And there is another alert here which tells the sales professionals, well, what you have to do in addition is get more prospects here and get more prospects here. So go back to the barrel of leads and try to get more into the, into the pipeline. Now let's assume that uh, 12 days are gone and we will see the same chart now if the salesperson doesn't do anything on April 30th. 
just the only uh, change what I what I did was changing the date here. That's it. See, that's on April 30th here. Now we have several two major um, alerts because the, even the average probability is below minus 11 here. These are major things, but almost all projects show alerts now with, the, uh, with only one exception, this one. Why not this one? Because the decision date is two months later than all the others. They have more time there. So this is, this is the This is the beauty of the uh, of measuring the sales uh, process. Sorry, the sales process. Um, and I, from this, I want to move on to what needs to be done in case the uh, inter uh, the ISBM uh, provides an alert, one of these alerts. So let's focus on some tools which are required to achieve the next level of the PS and RS factors on the road to win profitable sales projects. These are not all tools that I can ma ma um, describe now, but just some that are on the list. So we see here the two uh, major uh, processes. In the middle, this is the professionals, oops, in the middle here, that is the professional selling process in the basic and advanced version, and it's embedded in relationships to decision makers. These are the two processes, the main major process in the barrel of uh, prospects. So the basic um, professional selling uh, subjects include fulfill the customer's expectations, and differentiate yourself from competitors. This is a must. You have to do it, but it's not sufficient because all your competitors will do this as well. There is no difference. If you don't do it, you're out. If you do it, you're neutral. So you have to proceed and go to the advanced uh, items here, define and quantify values for each customer, and change or add decision criteria. And the last one I will uh, come back to uh, when we talk about sales strategies. I will go into quantification and def value definition a little bit more in detail right now. Um, sales professionals need to uh, typically need to precisely define at least five to seven individual value statements. That's just the rule of thumb for each prospect. And these uh, value statements have to take into account the prospect specific business situation, business objective, and market environment. A value statement must be precise and it must be accepted as a value by the potential customer. But value selling is mostly not used in an effective way. One reason is that the values are too general or not sufficient quantified. You know, everybody tells me they do value selling, but they don't because sales professionals often use general statements such as our product will substantially increase your productivity or they say your, our product will save you several thousand dollars per month. So the typical reaction of a decision maker, especially the CFO, is yes, you're right. This is a value for us, but you're still too expensive. And there goes the value and the margin and possibly also the sale. Now let's focus on how to avoid this situation and a possible uh, price reduction. Of course, your prices should, be not, should not be out of range compared to your competitors, but they don't need to be the lowest to win large orders. So how is this achieved? The magic approach is quantify each of the values. And there is a systematic process for value quantification and for attaching a comprehensible and correct amount to each value. I can't go into depth in that statement right now because that would fill another half an hour, but there is a process to do this. The next step is to present these quantified values 
in a return on investment chart as seen by the customer. This is a very, very simplified version, but I wanted to show you the point that I want to make in the end. What you see here is the time. Here's the time from uh, one to nine months. Uh, 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 this here are the costs for the customers, so they have to pay your company a in the beginning an amount of $120,000 in the uh, uh, for for the inst uh, for the products or services, so for the customer this is seen as a negative point, but then the customer enjoys seven quantified values. Five of them uh, add up to the blue bars here, and two additional ones add up to the red bars. So in total they enjoy values of fifty thousand per month. Then, as a result, this is the resulting curve, which is very very simple. The return investment point is 3.5 months. Now, let's look the co comparison to your competitors. See, there's a cheaper competitor. The cheaper competitor offers the same product for, or similar product, not the same, similar product to, or service for $100,000. So when you just look at the price, you are 20% more expensive than the others. So just looking at the price, you are out because you're more expensive. But the point is, the competitor delivers the five blue values, but not the two red values. The red values are unique for you. That's typically in companies that have a higher, slightly higher price. They have better values. The only thing you have to find that out and quantify them. Based on this, the curve from the competitor goes up that way and uh, hits the, uh, the return investment point here is about 4.4 months uh, compared to your 3.5 months. But um, one more thing is very important. The difference in $20,000 here that the customer has to pay more turns into a profit of the customer for, for of $140,000 after nine months. Isn't that convincing? That's what the CFO wants to see and to hear. And the numbers, again, must be correct, and there's a, pro a way to, to make them correct. So you may ask yourself, why isn't such a systematic approach to value selling being used more often? The primary reason is that it requires real effort. It's not easy to do that. Making uh, quantitative statements like better, faster, or lower cost, that's easy. Converting them into quantified statements like a 25% reduction in energy cost worth $3,000 per month or a 62% reduction in standby expenses spent for dealing with possible power outage worth $10,000 per month. That's hard, especially when the numbers must be correct. However, that's where the sales results are. The professional value concept is a powerful tool to prove the financial superiority of your company's offering to potential customers. It is also an important tool to decrease competitive intensity and to win orders in the competitive market. Okay, I mentioned sales strategies before. This is another powerful tool to use a sales strategy on your way to, on your road to win. There are five different sales strategies. By the way, whenever you ask a, in a sales professional and ask, what, is this, what do you know about sales uh, strategies? They don't know about it. They don't know. They have never heard about sales strategy. These are sales strategies are five general um, ways and strategy, the name strategy always requires an objective. The objective is generate profitable revenue. Okay. There are five different ways to do this. The direct strategy uh, is used if your company has a two to one superiority and this strategy then provides the fastest way to win. It's a quick way to get an order. The indirect strategy 
uh, is used when decision criteria can be changed. The concentration strategy is used if your company covers, um, it, uh, sorry, if your company is superior in parts of the offering uh, and in parts of the customer's requirements, but they can, can't fulfill the whole thing. But in, in one part, they are really the best in the world. That's concentration strategy. And circlement strategy is, is used when your company covers geographic areas or market niches where competition is not active in. And the, encircle, uh, the bypass strategy is used uh, by answering the question what, which potential customers or business sectors are not covered by competition. So what is the strategy that is almost exclusively used by almost all sales professionals? There's one that they exclusively use, just one. What, what is your guess? Direct. The first one, the direct strategy. So, but it can be used only if your company, successfully used only if your company has a two-to-one superiority. There are just a few companies in the world that have this superiority. I, I want to name one, it's Apple. Whenever they bring out a new product, it's so unique, everybody wants to get it. Even they don't possibly need to sell. They, they just show it and they get, get it sold. So this is a two-to-one superiority. If that is not the case, and the, your company does not have this, and 99, more than 99% of the companies don't have a two-to-one superiority because there's always some competitor out there, possi out there, possibly not with the same product and service, but with a solution that also would solve the customer's issue. In that case, using that direct strategy results in a price fight with your competitor. I can give you an example um, how, how it happens. Let's assume um, who will play the role of a customer, <laughs> a volunteer. Yeah, volunteer. Volunteer, one play the customer. Okay, you. So you're the customer, I c I'm now company coming from company A and I'll make it one hour sales presentation to you. Uh, I make it very short in two seconds now. <laughs> uh, it takes in real life one hour. So I, s I tell you, look dear customer, we understand your problems, uh, the requirements that you have. Uh, so, you know, you know, we offer this, 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 and this, and now you know we're the best. It takes one hour, okay? That was short. Now, I t turn around. Now, an hour later, you receive the competitor. So, now this salesperson comes to you and say, hey, look, what we have, we have one, two, three, four, five, and now you know we are the best. Now what happens is, uh, you, uh, until this guy left, you think for yourself, well, they are almost the same, you know, nothing's two to one superior, they're almost the same. Well, I could, I, I could make a decision for this or for this one, then, well, price is also comparable, it's not a big deal, they're almost the same. Things are the same, well, both of them could, could be a winner. How do you, what, what is your criteria then, what you try to apply to decide between the two? Price, uh, yes. You, you will say, okay, let's see who gives me the best price. So you're, you're playing with them. And that is exactly what, is requi what, what happens when the direct sales strategy is applied when you shouldn't do it. Thank you, that was the right answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the indirect strategy, I said, um, uses decision criteria, when a decision criteria can be changed. Now you say that's impossible. There are this group of decision makers, they have their criteria either written down or have it in their head so they know these are the criteria. How can an external guy, especially somebody from a company that wants to sell something to them, tell them they should change or add at their criteria. It's easy. Yeah, you know, it's easy, you know, it's easy. The point is, it all goes back to value quantification. So when you quantified a value that the competition doesn't have, rem remember the two values that are marked in the last chart with the red ones, they were your only ones. If one of them is huge, generates a huge uh, cost saving, whatever it is for the customer, 
you revert this value statement into a decision criteria and say, hey, you know, this value generates such a, a, a positive cost saving for you. It's, it's incredible. You should rank this quite high, or if you haven't looked at it, add it to your things. That's the way how to bring on a list, because these guys are looking at the financials, and they see, well, it makes sense. Yes, this is a criteria that helps, you, helps us a lot. Once they do this, competition is out. Okay, so let me summarize. Oops. What, what do we do? We implement a customized toolbox of systematic uh, sales process, successful sales strategies, and powerful sales management tools in your sales organizations. And the most important, we apply these tools to your day-to-day -day business. It's easy for me to talk about it. It's more difficult to do it. But we do it and help uh, our sales organizations to apply these tools and help them to win sales projects. So what are the benefits for our clients? Our clients enjoy an increase in revenue. We help them win key sales projects in their competitive markets. I mean, key sales projects are the most lucrative and most important ones for them. Increase the efficiency. We help them win up to 75% more sales projects with the same number of sales professionals, so they don't need to hire sales people, which have additional costs. They use their people to a much better extent, and they, these guys are also happy because they earn a better pro commission. Uh, we increase the profitability. We help them win new customers without sacrificing price. And uh, all this is a lasting implementation which will work and stay with them for many years. So thank you for your patience with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bert, I have a question for you. I have a question for you. Yeah. Many of the people here in this room this morning and a lot of our clients are what you would call smaller businesses. Would your system be applicable for a smaller environment as opposed to just a large environment? Yes. These systems work for small, medium, and large companies. And I'm, I'm, uh, what I see is that, especially in the small business area, the people have, uh, let me say, developed their product. They haven't looked into sales very much at all. And they need it the most because they have to compete. Although uh, some of the CEOs of small companies with a new business idea and a new product think, okay, we don't need to sell it, so we don't need to sell the product sells it itself. This is completely wrong. It is always competition out there. And the better these guys know how to sell, not only what they sell, the better it is for them and they can benefit very much. Any other questions? Uh, Hold on, John. Hold on. I'm interested in how you deliver the service. Is it as a consulting firm or workshops or coaching? Yes. That is a good question. I need a backup chart now. Just looking which one it is. Oops. Um, chart 18, please. No, nah, you're on your own. I'm, uh, I'm on my own, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, how it's delivered. It's again a process. Um, we start with an initial seminar. The seminar can be half a day or a day, which where we provide a more, much more in-depth uh, information. This one was just a little part of it, okay? Um, but this seminar, allows the people to understand the language or what we want to achieve, but still they are not able to do this because I said this is not easy to do. What we, after the seminar, we start working, doing B2B sales mentoring. For example, we, we spend one day individual with any sales professional or even the sales executive who has some special things to do. Uh, one day, one-to-one, -one, uh, one session is about one and a half hours, where we, for example, develop va values or whatever their issue is right with their most important sales project. 
Um, and at the end of, of a session, they have an action list. They have also uh, more definitions and have to talk to the customer to get feedback on certain things that we develop because we always involve the customer or prospect in it. So per day, with a one and a half day, uh, with one and a half hours per per session, we can handle about five to six, uh, five, well, five, five projects. After this has been done, we will work on the same projects a week or 14 days later, later because the sales professionals have to get in touch with the prospect in order to get the answers or get the feedback, which we will then use to continue from there. And then every one week or two weeks, we will sit together with the same people and um, continue to help them win that project. The sales mentoring session is a brainstorming session, but also it's an it results always in an action list. Now, depending on how many sales professions we have, of course, we may have two days in a row when we have 10 or 12 or more. Um, so for small companies, we can be flexibly adapt this. For large companies, we focus typically on the largest projects they want to win because we cannot handle one hundreds of salespeople because they needed too many people, too many sales mentors. But we will focus on the, um, the most important projects they want to win. In the small companies, we help them to start winning at all. And after they have won one or two or three projects by using this methodology, they can then um, get and doing this on their own. They start to do this on their own. But they need guidance the first two times to win. So that's how it's implemented. We have another question here. Uh, I realize this is a consulting-based kind of operation that you're proposing, but have you given any thought, or is there available a software solution to this whole management system? Yeah. For, first of all, I want to uh, precise, a little bit more precise, be precise with consulting, because the seminar sounds like consulting, but a consultant gives, gives advice, provides advice, and then turns around and runs away. We don't, we don't run away. <laughs> we provide the advice, and then we help them do it. That's a key thing, that what the consultant typically does, does not do. Now, what you've seen here, the, um, uh, the intelligent sales process management charts that I showed this example, this is programmed in Excel. Um, we can provide the Excel version, but we are also on our way to uh, program it at salesforce.com. It's not yet done, but the Excel version is accessible and can be implemented on your company system or can be integrated in another company forecasting system that you have already. I should also note that um, Gerd has agreed to become a mentor for HBCFI and will be able to assist our clients using his process. And as well, we're in the process of uh, discussion on organizing a formal seminar based on this process and, and open it up region, regionally. So I, I think this is a big step for us and our clients and uh, we urge you to take advantage. Um, you, you need the phone number sounds like San Francisco, the 415 is a San Francisco phone number. The reason is um, I worked in San Francisco before, before I moved to New Jersey, so I kept the phone number. Sorry for the confusion. He's still in a foreign <laughs> country, New Jersey. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, Gerd is going to be around for a little while, and he'll be available to answer any of your individual questions. I, I, I know there should be some formulating in your mind. And I thank Gerd for making this presentation. It's uh, a very unique presentation for this group, and I think very professionally done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.